So it's going to be uh, Hendrik Bremer, Senior Financial Advisor, PricewaterhouseCoopers Strategy from Austria. And he will be talking about uh, payment digitization trends internationally. So Hendrik Bremer is going to join us from PwC Strategy Consulting Firm in Vienna, Austria. Hendrik has more than 20 years of experience as a consultant of top management of banks and regulators in Europe and the Middle East. Perfect. I can hear you all very well. Perfect. Okay. I will. So, uh, I assume I can start. Come on, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. And thank you all very much for uh, the opportunity to share um, insights on payment trends, especially the digital payment trends, and uh, the role of, of banks, um, electronic money institutions, and fintechs, and also regulators. Maybe we can go to page number two uh, with the agenda. What I um, would like to talk uh, in the coming 30 minutes, 35 minutes about is, first of all, describing the landscape, what's happening in the payments industry. Then I would like to talk about uh, future trends, especially uh, a focus on open banking. Open banking, that means that uh, the more and more usage of uh, alternative data of new players entering the market and what is the impact on banks, but also the existing payment player. Then I also like to talk about regulatory approaches. So what role um, can regulators play, have been playing around the world to foster the uh, digitalization and also cashless uh, society. And I would like to conclude with new business models. Uh, there's a certain pattern that we see um, how new market entrants uh, start with payments, but then evolve to other products um, and uh, can become, let's say, an interesting and more relevant player uh, in certain markets, um, also as a challenger of uh, the existing bank. If you like. Uh, just I saw some people taking pictures. Uh, the presentation will be made available uh, by yourself. So um, I think all the things I share also in front of the uh, uh, slides that uh, will be shared with, uh, with you also afterwards. Let me start with uh, page number three about what's happening in the payments industry. What we see is that uh, there's a, a big transformation as in many industries, also in the payment industry. First of all, what we see is that uh, consumer behavior is, is changing, but also to be clear, uh, and, and those data are for Europe actually, are valid for Europe and therefore also more than valid I think in other regions, is that the level of digitization is still not there yet. What we see in Europe is that still 7 out of 10 payments at the point of sale, so in shops, in retailers, are still being done in cash. And if we talk about non-cash payments, yeah, still 75% is done by bank account to bank account transactions. So over here, still a lot of room for um, improvement. The same is true about smartphones. Across Europe, and there are differences in the countries, but only 30% uh, of the people are using their smartphones uh, for payments. And yes, of course, regulators are trying to foster this, the open banking regulation. PSD2 will be, uh, become effective in, in the course of this year. And this will, this will enable customers um, to, let's say, do account aggregation, uh, do faster online lending, uh, but again, uh, still very much cash-based. So a lot of room for improvement. On the other hand, we see a lot of, let's say, um, developments happening uh, from the technical perspective and also players' perspective. There are a lot of different payment schemes across Europe. Uh, and also what we see here is that 
the number of teams will still be increased, the number of metals will increase, uh, but there's also a lot of consolidation ongoing. And third, I think what is important is what we see there's pressure on the revenue. The interchange fees, for instance, have been decreasing over the past few years significantly and uh, more pressure to come. This is driven on the one hand by market forces, if you like, but also regulators play an important role here. So that's what's happening in the industry itself. If we go to the next page, number four, what we see is that there is uh, an, an, a massive industry consolidation ongoing. Yeah? Um, uh, players are merging. Yeah, um, fintechs are entering the market and uh, will start cooperating and deals are happening with traditional players. But there's also a lot of massive external pressure. We all might have heard about the companies like Friends for a while and Revolut that started entering the remittances market. Yeah, and high margin market uh, with a lot of, let's say, uh, improvement for uh, higher convenience and price pressure. We see a lot of, let's say, models upcoming, uh, new players who have mobile POS solutions, yeah, like Square and like iZettle. And we see, of course, the, uh, the big techs entering the markets yeah, with payment solutions, Apple Pay, Google Pay, but also card solutions. Then there are the social media networks, yeah? uh, WeChat, a leading one in, in China, of course. Uh, we see PayPal extending its product offering. And of course, um, Libra, uh, let's say the new kid on the block. Um, I think we've heard and read a lot, I think a bit more than a month, a month ago, about the Facebook initiative to start offering peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, using blockchain making it potentially a new cryptocurrency. Um, and that is, of course, one of the things I think as an, indus as an industry we were waiting for. Mm -hmm. uh, because we all know the stories about Airbnb, uh, the biggest, uh, um, if you want, hospitality company without owning a hotel. Or Uber, the biggest trend, uh, taxi company in the world without owning any taxis. And also in the financial services industry, this was expected. And obviously, Facebook is one of the players with a significant scale that could really disrupt the industry. Uh, what I said before, I think one month ago, a lot of buzz was around this. We saw regulators also entering the market now and or entering the discussion. So let's see where this will, will end up. Uh, I think it will not be an easy one from one day to the other. But what we see at least, there's massive, let's say, external pressure. The good news, though, is on the right side of the uh, of the slide, is that we expect um, uh, a high increase in acceptance points, POSs, a massive 10 times more uh, POS uh, acceptance of, of payments by um, electronic devices. Um, also, the number of payment methods will increase significantly. Yeah? So if you want by four times, 400%. Also, the revenue will increase and the number of transactions even more. Uh, that is also driven by not only usage will increase, but also that we see um, that the number of transactions by volume, so the, the tickets will be smaller, yeah? of small payments, which, which will increase significantly. Having said that, um, maybe a bit more in detail on page five, the next slide. What we see is that um, across the board, there's a lot of consolidation ongoing, a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Um, uh, the amount of deals in, in 2017, beginning of 2018, was around 25 billion uh, in different areas. What we already see, though, is even in 2019, yeah, and we're half, more than halfway, uh, we've seen even larger transactions yeah, with first data, uh, but also global payments. Yeah, working, playing an active role in, in the consolidation of the payment markets. And it's about expanding the skills, it's about consolidation itself. And uh, what we see is that also venture capital uh, companies and private equity firms are playing an active role here. So that's also a hint for you know the room for a consolidation. If we talk about the, the potential 
let's maybe go to page number six. This is about um, the non-cash payment maturity. What does this uh, chart say? The metric says, uh, on the one hand, the number of payments yeah, per capita, um, uh, payments by cards, and uh, payments by, let's say, non-cards, all but cards, as we call it. So it means cash, it means electronic banking transfers, and it also includes direct debit. So if, if that is on in balance, yeah, you'll have the, the gray arrow. And there are many countries who are at that gray arrow, um, of course, on different levels of number of payments. What I think is interesting is, for instance, one of the largest markets in, in Europe, Germany. Um, that market is, is if you want, a, a very much uh, cashless uh, or cash-driven society. Yeah, there's a lot of room for uh, emerging here, uh, payments. So what you see is that there are really laggards in, in debit and credit card transactions. Yeah? On the other hand, the prerequisites of electronic payments are in place. I mean, the card penetration, meaning the number of people do, that do have cards, is at a similar level like one of the Nordic countries, yeah, Denmark. It's higher than France. So people do have their electronic, let's say, cards. They have the opportunity to pay by debit card and, and credit card. Also, if you, look, if you look at the point of sale, mm, it's not top, but still in the, in the first half or let's say third of the countries. Yeah, so a lot of point of sales uh, where it is possible to pay electronically. On the other hand, um, the ATM density, so the availability of cash is very high. So it's much higher than in the UK or also in Nordic countries. So it's easy for people to acquire cash and use the ATMs. But still, if the, the, the prerequisites are in place, um, the industry you know, should get its act together in motivating people to use um, cashless transaction more and more. So that's still, again, uh, although Europe is at the global forefront, there is still a huge room for increasing uh, cashless transactions. Um, what we also see, and that's maybe supporting the uh, usage of, of um, electronic payments, if you go to page seven, it's about product innovation, what we've been seeing over you know, the past years. And we see that the number of innovations is increasing significantly. So that puts pressure, of course, on you know, the banks, the card schemes, and also um, the established card players and the operators. So what we've seen is, uh, yes, contactless payments, um, significantly driven also by NFC technology. We've seen card controls. I think that was also an important driver of creating trust by consumers. Card controls, what I mean by that is that it's possible for customers uh, to activate or, um, or say, block their uh, uh, credit cards or accounts. Um, what we also see is the biometric ident uh, identification or authentication. So the usage of, um, of, of, let's say, fingerprints, also face recognition is coming. Um, and what we also see now in Europe is that the two-factor authentication will be required also from by the end of the year. So it's not only, uh, let's say, the PIN code, um, also an SMS or yeah, mobile phone driven uh, uh, PIN code or uh, TAN code has to be used. So also to increase trust and, and security. So that puts you again, as I said, pressure on, um, on, on this innovation, puts pressure on the existing players, but also it's an opportunity for new players. And that's what we can see on the next page, on page number eight. Um, what we see here is um, different, let's say, peer-to-peer -peer schemes um, that have been evolved over the past, let's say, five to ten years, and I think it's even more five years than ten years. Um, new payment schemes, either companies uh, developed as, as a fintech or new companies being set up by existing players, so by the banks. Um, in the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, payment area, area, there's a lot ongoing. And most of its markets have developed new solutions next to what banks have been offering. And also the acceptance yeah, of certain of those, some of those schemes has been significant. 
Yeah, especially in the Nordic countries and in Europe, they are leading in this area. But a lot of peer-to-peer -peer schemes are being used outside of the regular, I would say, banking and even electronic banking and, and uh, online banking solutions. So also here, this is a hint that um, there's a lot of movement going. There's a lot of room for new players and acceptance rate can increase significantly. That depends again on regulatory environment, the consumer behavior, but also by, uh, how to say it, the quality of the, of the solutions. And this all is also being driven by the mobile phone, smartphones, yeah, by the data speed. So G5 technology and now, it, uh, sorry, G4 has been in, in implemented, G5 technology upcoming. So the speed, availability and convenience um, of this technology is also driving uh, the acceptance by consumers. That means that the trends in the industry, yeah, if I now go to, to page number nine, uh, puts a lot of, let's say, challenges, yeah, this environment on, on banks. And they need to define how to position themselves um, in, in this market. Yeah? What we see um, on the left-hand side, yeah, everyone and everything yeah, can become a merchant. So the ways to pay uh, online will increase significantly. The places where I can pay online will increase significantly. So that's a good thing um, for consumers. What we see also is that there's growth by number of transactions and also by revenue, although margins are under pressure. But what we see also is that the share of uh, banks in, in, in the payment industry is decreasing. Yeah, we see now that a lot of acquiring and issuing uh, players um, are taking a, a share of the revenue from banks, but we expect also, uh, let's say, alternative payment methods that will take a significant share away from banks in the coming years. Um, so the way of playing it, of course, is consolidation. So a lot of deals uh, ongoing um, in, in many markets. Um, and what we also see is that um, in line with what we say revenue share, there's also consolidation. So top players will take a bigger share of the, uh, of the market. Yeah. So a lot of challenges in the payment industry, I think for good innovation. Um, the market itself is open. It's not clear you know, who will win, but it's clear that banks are under pressure here. Um, and that, that brings me also to uh, the next chapter, so on page 10, about what other trends uh, do we see, apart from the cashless potential. Yeah, so there's still a lot of uh, potential in, in uh, and onboarding new customer segments, a lot of innovation ongoing, consolidation, and revenue pressure. But what else do we see? On, on page 11. Um, why is the payment market not as boring as it was a few years ago? Yeah, because the payment industry was seen as uh, the core, of course, of banking, uh, but quite stable. Um, and what we see over the past few years is a lot of innovation. As I mentioned before, it's driven by the technology, the possibilities, um, on, and of course the room for improvement regarding convenience yeah, and also pricing. I think also uh, a lot of us agree that uh, uh, banking can be made much more easy. And of course, it's driven by the companies like Amazon, uh, but also the usage of technology uh, and social networks, yeah? uh, that people are more and more open for using new technologies in, in a more transparent way. Uh, TransferWise, I think, is one of the many examples um, that also position themselves very clearly in a market with high fees, high margins, in it, the remittances uh, payment market, and uh, explain this very clearly uh, to their customers, you know, uh, showing clear fee uh, advantages and also convenience in, in the users. They made a nice movie, a nice video on this, um, which I think I would recommend you to have a look into, uh, but later on, I will not show it and share it with you today. Um, but in this context, let's see what are the forces at work if we go to next page 12, we looked at it as, as PwC strategy and globally, what are the trends uh, um, shaping the future of the payments industry? 
And I'd like to take out four of those, of those trends. First of all, open banking. A lot has been talking about it uh, by regulators, by banks, by fintechs. But what is behind it? I'd like to share with you. The mobile payment share, cashless, yeah, so cash displacement as we call it. And then Internet of Things, also a topic where a lot has been talking about by the usage of mobile phones and Internet. But what's the role of payments in this? And of course, I think in the end, what is relevant for yourself is also to see, okay, how can that be translated into the Pakistan banking environment? Uh, because what maybe has not been said before in the introduction, um, I'm not an expert for the Pakistan banking market, but uh, I have a feeling there, based on project work uh, I'm doing actually in Pakistan. My last visit to Pakistan was in June, and I'll be back there in uh, in September. But back to the uh, to the trends. Uh, open banking on on page 13. A lot of logos, a lot of topics, and maybe that is already the message. What we see is that. Um, driven by technology, driven by regulatory uh, uh, enablement, we see that there's many opportunities by using, let's say, transaction information based on digital payments, mobile payments. So analytics can be done. Uh, the technology enables um, new business ideas um, in, in different areas, so around cards, usage around the accounts, but also about lending, credit. So what we see, of course, is that uh, on the cards area, on the left-hand side, it's a lot about, let's say, uh, non-plastic, um, so electronic mobile schemes uh, that starts entering uh, different markets. It's about new opportunities, about loyalty schemes. What I personally think is interesting, again, being, you know, having worked in the banking market for 20 years, this was a big topic, loyalty schemes, I would say 20 years ago, um, with all its successes and failures. But what we see is that loyalty cards, also by the usage of mobile data, mobile phones, is uh, getting a revival. Yeah, so also here, a lot of new business models are, are possible, possible. Around accounts, what we see here are new operators entering the market, uh, making usage of uh, account aggregation. So helping customers in getting more transparency on where they do transactions, um, how to help them in their savings and, and give them insights in, in their spending behavior and how to optimize that. So a lot of fintechs are entering that field globally. If it's around credit, what we see is on the one hand, due to usage of open banking uh, and access to account information, um, uh, banks and also fintech players um, have, well, have an easier situation in doing credit scoring. Yeah, they have an online in access to their accounts, so the, the payment behavior of customers, and that information can be used for online lending. What we also see is that companies like Klarna put themselves in between the bank and the retailer and offering financing, not only payment, but also financing opportunities. And of course, companies uh, like Amazon, uh, with a lot of data insights on, on their merchants. Yeah, they see how many transactions are being done by the merchants, which ones are successful, which ones are growing. Uh, they use these insights uh, for doing financing too. So again, making use of data and, and uh, uh, the ability to develop new business models out of it is being used very much by fintech players. More, I think, at the moment than banks, but banks are learning, of course, by cooperating with fintech or also copying, you know, the new technologies and the new processes being introduced by fintechs. So that's, I think, an interesting trend. If we go to the next page, page 14, it's about mobile payments. And it's a bit more in, in, in detail what I mentioned before, that in Europe, the number of consumers using smartphones for mobile payment is, is simply, you know, 13%. And yes, we have Nordic countries uh, that are significantly ahead with 30%, but it's still 30% only. Yeah? And assuming that, or knowing that uh, almost 100% of the people do have um, a smartphone, do have a bank account, um, there's still room for, uh, let's say, a massive improvement here. And again, Germany uh, here, 5% uh, of the population is using it. 
So I think it's a bit shocking to see, and you might expect uh, a much higher percentage here, but it's still about the convenience of using cash um, that is preventing people from using the um, mobile phones yet. Yeah? Uh, and also if you ask people, what are the reasons for using smartphones uh, for paying, if they do so, it's about all about convenience. Yes, it's about the functionality. Yes, it's about rewards uh, that can trigger that. But convenience is the major um, trigger. I think what we see in Europe is another example, NFC. Mm, NFC is a simple feature in the sense that paying online on the POS, uh, typically you have to type in uh, a PIN code, which costs a few seconds. And of course, people sometimes have the feeling that they need to look and care a bit about their PIN codes that is not being copied or yeah, uh, uh, copied by others or other people walking around. So the NFC functionality enables them, especially with uh, smaller payments, to do it instantly, saving you a few seconds, but also feeling-wise, it's quite perceived as safe. So those kind of functionalities will increase the feeling of convenience and also the usage of, of mobile payments. So also room here. Then going to um, uh, page 15, uh, cash, cash displacement as said as a consequence. Yeah? A few people are still using mobile payments, which means that many people are still using cash as the preferred method. Also in a country like Germany, but also Austria, where I live myself, 60% um, of the population and, and people simply use cash as the preferred method of payment. The reasons are, of course, it's easy access to cash, which is driven by the high network density of ATMs. Um, also, if I speak for Austria, for instance, it doesn't cost anything to withdraw cash from the ATM. Yeah, that's included in your account or account fees. Um, so there are a lot of steps to be done to move to a cashless society, or at least um, a higher share of cashless. Yeah. It's about the technology and make it convenient. It's also to, to explain that holding cash yeah, is not always necessary and, and can be cumbersome. Of course, there's a story about transparency. Yeah. People feel that paying by cash is, you know, cannot be traced and it's, it's more, let's say, anonymous. So also here, uh, for small amounts, uh, the anonymity of payments uh, can also be offered. So those are a few drivers of, of uh, supporting um, uh, cashless, yeah, cashless payments across the globe and certainly also in, in Europe. Another trend where to work on and where we see uh, developments is around a topic not spoken about, it's on page 16, is the Internet of Things. So it's the connection and making use of, of uh, buying services uh, in, in many different areas, not only food, not only buying books uh, and, and clothes online. It's also about parking uh, um, payments or toll, road tolls. It will come up to battery charging if you talk about um, electronic car, uh, electric cars. And also in the insurance industry, for instance, uh, what we see the innovations around uh, instant insurance. Yeah? When you do sports, uh, um, when you do travel, uh, etc. So also here, payment functions are required. And here, there's a lot of room um, for, let's say, innovative solutions. So also here, we see a big driver of um, electronic payments, yeah, the Internet of Things. If we conclude what we see as, as future trends um, on, on, on page 17, yeah, I have to say that uh, a few of the things were maybe Europe-based, but valid for sure also uh, in other areas globally. But what we see is um, trends in the direction on page 17 of even invisible or embedded payments. Yeah, you walk into a supermarket, uh, based on your smartphone, there is an identification. You can take your products and you can simply walk out. Yeah? This is happening and, and working already in, in China, for instance. The same is true about biometrics, the use of biometrics. Uh, we all now know that you know, the smartphones, we can unlock it by a fingerprint. But what we also see is that the usage of, of uh, face recognition for payments 
um, is being used. And this will also increase and make the easiness uh, of payment even easier. Of course, customers have to be willing to accept this. Um, the acceptance here, not only technology-wise, but also the role of the regulator about data usage is, of course, an important thing, which is being handled differently from region and from country to country. But what we see is that, at least, that those developments will go and happen quicker and quicker. So that means that as bankers, as fintech companies, we need to be you know, um, aware of those trends and, and think about how to react and act to this. So this was, if you want, the two chapters, uh, if we go to page 18, about what we see as trends in the payment industry, what we see as future trends and, and upcoming uh, uh, trends involving uh, electronic payments. And what I think on the next chapter, um, the role of the regulator. What can they play or what have they been playing already in different countries around the world? Um, to act, well, to promote, actually, uh, digital payments and the cashless society. Let me bring you to page number 19. What does this say? This is a, an overview of the different type of licenses. Yeah, there are in, in different markets, and I think um, those are valid for most of the markets. Uh, I know in Pakistan, you know, we have some, let's say, uh, uh, even more uh, license types than I've been showing you on this page. Um, but what I want to say is that it's from the level of regulation and capital requirements um, on, the, on the one hand side, on the left hand side, the typical banking license with the ability to offer not only lending, but also collect deposits and reinvest this. So the broadest, let's say, services and servicing offer that can be done, typically done by universal banks or specialized institutions for retail or commercial banking or investment banking, with capital requirements north of one million US dollars. Yeah, in Austria it's about five million dollars, in other countries ten million dollars, but at least you need significant capital to set up and acquire a banking license, highly regulated. Then we have the, if you want, the typical non-bank financial institutions, uh, consumer finance players, uh, car lenders, um, that offer lending. Yeah? They don't do deposits. So it's a lighter regulation, um, but still regulation also around consumer protection, uh, pricing, and, and interest rates. Um, typically, the capital required for this type of business is significantly lower than for banks. And then we come to, let's say, electronic money, e-money institutions. They offer and focus on payments, yeah, peer-to-peer -peer payments. Uh, they offer um, um, issuing and acquiring payment solutions, remittances payments, and also the e-money institution, they can offer wallets, yeah, digital currencies. Typically, those are online players uh, or uh, remittances specialists. Here, in Europe, also here, the capital requirements are less than for uh, banks, obviously, and also for non-bank uh, uh, financial institutions. Um, a, if you want, a subset of e-money um, e players are uh, payment service providers. Um, with the difference is that they are not allowed to offer uh, wallets or digital currencies, but they can do payments. They can offer payment accounts. They can offer credit cards or debit cards. And typically, this is a segment where also fintechs start to enter the market. Yeah, the capital requirements are less. Um, the, the product offering is limited. Um, but what we see is that this is a typical license where fintechs are going for when they start the business. On the left hand, on the right hand side, what we see here is um, it's called uh, PISP or AISP. Those are, if you want, new licenses in Europe um, connected to the Payment Service Directive number two, um, what I mentioned also before, that is being introduced now across Europe. And this is about open banking. It is about payment initiators. So those are companies that can, upon request of consumers, initiate payments yeah, from one bank account to the other or on the POS. Or even you have account information service providers. So fintech companies, 
that offer um, only information collection, not even transactions. That they use the data of transactions to provide other, if you want, banks or fintech players with information. They offer insights in transactions to consumers. It's also a very, if you want, small and narrow um, uh, servicing offering, but it's typically also an entry for new companies because low capital requirements, high level of usage of technology, and an innovation. So what we see here is that apart from the typical banking license and the non-bank uh, financial institution licenses, new licenses have been introduced over the past few years and are being introduced. And this is to decrease the market entry barriers. As we know, financial services is a serious industry because it's about money, and therefore it's good that it's being regulated, um, but it's also good to decrease the market um, entry barriers for, if you want, new players to foster innovation. And that's what we also see, that those new players come up with new products, new features that trigger convenience, that trigger digital usage of, of, of payments and banking. And it is, has, by the way, also a positive impact on the traditional players. Because also banks across Europe now start improving their onboarding processes. Yeah, they use video identification. They use, let's say, mobile uh, phone applications that are becoming better and better. So I think it is a healthy situation that you have new licenses to decrease the entry barriers and to foster innovation and also competition. What I also think is important is that uh, fintech companies and new market entrants, they want to be regulated, they want to be taken serious. Yeah. One, and one method of handling, uh, if you want fintech players, is saying, well, you're not regulated, yeah, and that's still happening in certain markets, but that's not what fintech companies want. Yeah. They want to be regulated, of course, in a, let's say, reasonable way, and that's what can be done by those type of licenses. Um, coming to uh, page 20 and, and sharing with you a bit of the view of what the European Union is aiming for. Uh, and this is what you see on this page, is what the European Union is saying that they're intending to do. Yeah? It's not necessarily re reality yet. If I say PSD2, I think it's a good thing. If you look into the details, for instance, the specifications, the process itself, there's still room for improvement here. Um, but what uh, the European Union is, is aiming for is to foster uh, innovation, but of course focus very, very much on customer privacy, uh, data protection, um, and also protect the customers, yeah, on whether it's on fraud. So always put customers, yeah, on, on, on if you want, on the protective side, um, and also prevent over-indebtedness. Yeah? That's done by if you want uh, um, debt to income ratios, that's done by caps on, in, on interest rates, etc. And of course, as Europe is very, let's say, uh, diversified, there's a strong focus on introducing new technologies across the European Union. For instance, there's a strong push now uh, to instant, uh, instant payment solutions. Um, so I think that is important to, to, to understand. What we see is that um, um, the regulation is also pushing um, to, to challenge profitability. So there's a lot of, let's say, interference also on, on changes if you talk about interchange or if you talk about ethics, yeah, limitations on, on dynamic currency conversion. So regulators playing an active role. If we go to maybe to page 22, all in the light of time, um, what we see is that Europe, again, is trying to develop a, a, and foster um, uh, online payments, digital payments, by creating a, a common market, yeah? and uh, also give a clear role and foster financial services players, so banks and fintechs. Unlike maybe in China, where you see a lot of ecosystems yeah, around Alipay or, or WeChat uh, that are building up financial services, in Europe there's a strong focus on um, uh, managing, let's say, banks and, and fintech companies. I think um, there's a lot of things that, that um, regulators can do to support cashless society. Um, of course, what are the benefits? 
it's about inclusion, financial inclusion. Yeah. Also, um, using smartphones, mobile technology, uh, offering lending and also cash and, and oh, sorry and, and uh, uh, payments um, into a higher share of the population. Of course, um, mobile uh, payments and digital payments might increase uh, the share of uh, the formal economy. Yeah. And of course, uh, it should also foster the convenience. What I'd like uh, to share, and maybe just in the light of time, because I got a message from my colleagues now that maybe I should push a bit further. Uh, let's maybe go to page 25, if that's possible. Because again, to foster, um, to foster um, uh, cashless society, I think there are many, let's say, influences. So the regulator can play a key role, the government, but also the payment schemes and, schemes and the banks. We think there are, let's say, informal and formal levers. Yeah, the informal levers is about sharing that, you know, uh, cash is king uh, is not always true. Yeah? Make it cheaper to use digital payments, make it more convenient and, and faster. Here we see initiatives by different uh, governments around, uh, around the globe. Um, also to incentivize this, um, I think um, what we see is that, uh, for instance, in South, in South Korea, uh, we see tax incentivations for retailers. Yeah? If they say more than 75% of their transactions are done uh, digitally, they get tax advantages. Yeah? Uh, the same is true in Argentina, where they motivate uh, customers to use online transactions and use payments so that they get VAT rebates. So also it can be done by uh, motivating by financial incentives. Um, and that's, again, can be triggered by the governments or, or regulator. So I think here is a long list of, of um, activities that have been done um, in many countries around the globe. So that's maybe also something to look into from a Pakistan perspective. Let me then as I said, you will have access to the, to, to the slides uh, that are in this presentation. But let me simply conclude then and go to the next page 29. Yeah, so we've been talking about trends in digitization. We've been talking about the, rule, the role of, of regulators that they can play and, and support creating a good environment, uh, a trusted environment and also an attractive environment uh, by incentivization. Uh, for consumers to start using uh, and, and use more digital payments. The question is now, what new business models do we see? And what we do see happening to promote uh, digital payments? Going to page 13, this is the page I shared with you already before. I think it is important for markets and for regulators to create an environment uh, where the market entry barriers are lower. Yeah? So, for instance, also digital banking license is something to think of. Yeah? So, again, create a level playing field for new entrants, transparent, um, but also give them the chance to develop those new innovations. What we see, for instance, and I'd like to share a few cases uh, at the end, on, on page 31. This is one of the challenger banks or neo banks in, in Europe, N26, it's called. Uh, it's founded by um, former colleagues of myself um, coming from Austria and they're expanding aggressively across Europe, also entering now the United States. This was FinTech. Those were two gentlemen that started the idea of a mobile only bank. And um, let me share with you the two streams on licensing, how they evolved here, and also the product development. Because yes, they started offering a card they started offering payments only, a card for free usage, and also international transfers. In the beginning, they didn't have a license themselves. They cooperated with a bank who provided the banking license. Over time, they started offering not only payments, but also, uh, apart from the credit card and debit card, started offering lending solutions and also investment solutions. And what they did is, is that instead of offering the products themselves, they cooperated with other fintechs and banks. Understanding that it's not necessarily to offer all the products by yourself in the beginning. Over time, they started 
not only getting a, a, a payment license or an electronic money license, they also started getting a full banking license. And that's what they have today. So they used the lower entry market and entry barriers by using lighter, if you want, financial services licenses. But again, over time, as they are now, a full bank. So it shows as a nice example of fintechs entering the market uh, by the ability to use, let's say, lighter financial services licenses and increasing their product portfolio over time by also getting into a full bank. And also innovation. Making the onboarding process very light and, and, and easy uh, was the key success factor for them. And interestingly enough, they now also work on product innovations and, for instance, um, also on the pricing policy. They start with many things for free, but offering better services and um, attracting different segments that are willing to pay for those online banking and mobile banking services. For instance, they have introduced a metal card, a physical metal card, uh, which is very non-online, if you like, which is being um, very successful and loved by, by many of their customers. So again, it's the roadmap of product development what we see. Another example, two examples if you like, is that we see is that this open banking approach, starting from payments, but evolving the product portfolio over time, and also introducing, let's say, from a e-money license, what Revolut did, uh, to a full banking license over time, is um, in that environment yeah, that can, uh, and, well, that enables actually fintechs to enter the market, foster innovation, and increase the digitization of, 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 ba of banking, if you like, including the, the payment transactions. PayPal is the same. They also started as an online payment provider and are now increasing their service offering into lending, into merchant lending, and also into investment products. So I think that is what we see that new entrants. Um, supported by adapted regulation, um, can trigger innovation in the market, can trigger competition, um, but also increase digitization. And also, when we talk about payments, uh, we, I mentioned before Facebook as, as a potential new market entrant. If we go to the last page, page 33, what we see is that, you know, uh, we see this pattern of new players what I mentioned by PayPal, Revolut, or N26. Um, Facebook will be upcoming. We have been waiting for the big, big tech to enter this market. But I think what we also see is that disruptive innovation does not come from one day to the other. Let me, let me share that uh, by the example of Blockbuster and Netflix. And we can have more examples in other industries. That Blockbusters was the big video rental company in the US with a valuation of $8 billion and more in the 90s. Yeah. Um, then Netflix was upcoming. Netflix is not a new firm. Yeah. They were upcoming already in the 2000s. So it took a quite a while uh, to get substantial market share and create also awareness outside of the US. Nowadays, everybody is aware about Netflix. But even what happened is in the year 2000, uh, so where there was the first, if you want, internet um, bubble or internet hype, uh, Netflix was even offered to blockbusters for an amount of $50 million. Management reaction in those days was, well, we don't see a viable business model. Um, we don't see a viable business model uh, in this arena. Unfortunately, time has uh, shown that they were wrong. Yeah, in 2010, um, due to the digitization, due to the technological uh, technological uh, uh, improvements and, and access of and access and improvement of streaming, um, Netflix could improve its market share and product offering, and Blockbuster, well, suffered from uh, from this, that people were not willing to use bricks and mortar anymore for going uh, outside to get a, a video. Mm -hmm. So, and now we know, of course, that, uh, um, that the rest is history, if you like. Uh, today, uh, Netflix market cap is uh, 128 billion US dollars. Yeah. So, I think the message of this is that, again, Disruptive innovation is not coming from one day to the other. Also, Facebook will not you know, disrupt the market from one day to the other. So there is still a good chance uh, for fintechs and also existing players and banks uh, to react and act um, in, in the digitization arena. 
So this is what I'd like to uh, conclude with. Um, I do hope that those insights um, are a bit of food for thought for you uh, for the conference today. Um, if there are questions, I think it's maybe best we can you can uh, um, contact me also. My details can be shared by uh, Kapran, uh, also my PwC colleagues in the room. And I'm happy to uh, to react to your to your questions. Um, I would like to uh, wish you a good and interesting rest of the day, and uh, I'd like to thank you for um, for your attention. Thank you very much.